fantastic. To all of you still left here, we know it's late. Uh, we are going to talk about pitfalls of benchmarking big data. And we're basically going to be telling a lot of stories. So hopefully we'll be able to keep you awake. I'm Gwen Shapira. I'm horribly echoing to myself. I'm echoing to everyone else too. Am I still echoing? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm still echoing. Probably his microphone. <laughs> I'm wondering you want, may want to turn yours off or? Oh, but we're gonna rotate, so. Okay. That's all right, I'll just stand. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm uh, currently a software engineer at Cloudera. Uh, previously, I was a consultant in various companies, working with a lot of uh, relational databases, Oracle. And then when I moved to Cloudera, I worked with Hadoop customers. Everyone always wants to know how fast the system is and how many servers they actually need to buy. So lots of benchmarking around that. The first benchmark of my career was in year, I think, 2000, late 2000, maybe about uh, 14 years ago. And we were taking a new, totally new software system to production. And we knew what workload we had to sustain in production. Uh, so we took a nice test system. It had five machines. We ran our software. We checked what's the capacity of five machine cluster. And we got a number X. And we knew that in production we needed to support 6X. So we said, fantastic, we'll run production with 30 machines. This worked for almost 30 full minutes in production, where the network got over, overloaded basically uh, from the overhead of communication between 30 machines. The network became the bottleneck. No communication happened. The whole thing came crashing down. Rollbacks, people working 36 hours, me included. And I swore to never extrapolate again, ever. So hi, we're actually going to split the talk, and uh, we're going to just uh, alternate. Um, I'm Yan Pei. I'm on the performance engineering team at Cloudera. I make things go fast. Uh, so previously, I was at Cal, where I also made things go fast. So I started working on big data and Hadoop performance uh, way back, uh, just a couple of years after it came out. And my very first Hadoop performance, actually my very first Hadoop job, I ran it uh, by mounting a, the local drives of the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS, on our departmental network attached filer. So this is the filer that supported all of the professors, the students, and the staff. Of course, I took down the filer, and the result of that is I got hate mail for a week. And for members of the audience from Cal, you probably have a guess of who that admin was. By the way, um, uh, just a uh, background uh, kind of uh, knowledge type check. Uh, when we say Hadoop and um, Hadoop distribu distributed file systems, um, how many of us have experience on that? Ooh, Very good. Nice. nice. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> and we have a bird of feather tonight, so I hope to see all the Hadoopers there sharing tips and tricks. And we're going to have uh, some Q&A between ourselves during this talk, and so, you know, um, hopefully we'll have plenty of question time and you guys can quiz us as well. Okay, so in this presentation, we are going to try to give you tools to run and evaluate benchmarks. And we're going to do this by example and by criticizing our own work. So we'll show what we did here and show how we uh, evaluate our own work uh, using some examples. And the goal was not to make, the reason we are using our own work is we didn't want to hurt any feelings, we didn't want to make fun of anyone who is not up here to defend himself. We are kind of being nice and taking the high road. However, we are not the only people in the world making benchmarking mistakes. These are just examples. All the mistakes we see here also apply to other benchmarks. You can Google up your favorite vendor and criticize his work. We are just not feeling very good doing it to other people on stage. So also um, a comment on that. So uh, we do believe we are the leading vendor in big data. 
And we do believe we are very, very rigorous and scientific in our approach to performance benchmarking. So the um, pitfalls you see here from our own experience, these are kind of the, even with best intentions, even with good practices, these are still the things that can still come up and bite you. And this will be the story of our own behind the scenes engineering experience in diagnosing that. Okay. Things that you don't see in any of our marketing material. Okay, so the first mistake we see a lot of people, including us, make is make a comparison that shouldn't be done at all. So you're running two tests, and usually you are running a benchmark to compare between systems. You change one parameter and expect it to be the only parameter to change. If unintentionally you changed a lot of things, completely invalidates the test, any comparison is impossible. So to ensure fair comparison, if you're comparing hardware, obviously you want to run the exact same workload on both systems. If you're comparing ha uh, hardware running Oracle on one side and SQL Server on the other side, you're doing something very wrong, you're not comparing hardware. If you're comparing two different frameworks, you want to make sure that you're running the same queries on the same size of data, the same types of compression, the same type of algorithms, and so on and so on. No, absolutely no point in making comparisons otherwise. So, for example... Yay, story time. Um, actually, can you advance one more slide? Sure. So, uh, this is earlier in the year. Earlier in the year, we did a, shipped a major version of Cloudera distribution, including Apache Hadoop, or CDH. Um, there, we shipped, for the first time, MapReduce 2. So now the, the first version of MapReduce that came out, the Apache MapReduce version, that is now overtaken uh, by a version that runs in Yarn, Yarn Shore for yet another resource negotiator. So this is a major change in the backbone of a lot of production systems at customers across multiple industries. So four of the five major banks in the US, they're going to count on this, et cetera. So as a part of the shipping effort, one of the things we have to convince ourselves before we convince the rest of the community is that the two versions of MapReduce are at performance parity. So we run a large suite of uh, MapReduce jobs. Among them, one of the go-to jobs is a very limited test, Terrasor, but it's still a useful first step in comparing performance for MapReduce. Now, Terrasor is derived from the official SOAR benchmark, the one started by Jim Gray, is now continued by others. Um, the intent is to generate and sort random data. However, the data generation part in MapReduce 1, it generated data that's not completely, truly random. In MapReduce 2, there's an improved data generation process that generates more random data. So intuitively, sorting random data is harder than sorting already kind of not random data. So if we compare Terrasol performance for MapReduce 1 and MapReduce 2, we immediately see MapReduce 2 has very, very bad performance. Turns out we're doing an apples and oranges comparison. One of them we're sorting semi-random data. The other one we're sorting more random data. So that's a story of... Um, uh, we did a lot of engineering effort to try to see where the performance difference or regression is. It's only after we eliminated, eliminated a bunch of stuff that we realized, oh, the code origin, the, the data generation part actually changed. So truly an apple to oranges type comparison. Second mistake we make is the mistake I did to start my career, not testing at enough scale and assuming what you do is relevant. And as a reminder, this is called big data for a reason. If your data set fits completely in memory, you may be doing something slightly different. If you are taking something tiny and saying, let's assume everything grows linearly and say, oh, our system is fantastic for big data, this is the wrong thing to do. And there is a lot of uh, little subtleties. Obviously, taking five machines and saying it will be exactly the same at 30 is kind of obvious. But when you're testing at scale, there's all those different types of scale. So the size of the data is one of them. The concurrency, there's different types of concurrency. You can run with a lot of small jobs. You can run with a small number of actually large jobs that process more data. 
you can saturate the network, you can saturate CPU, you can have a lot of contention on locks, latches, mutexes, all kinds of things. And you can also have dependency on components that are non-obvious. So, for example, HBase has a strong dependency on Zookeeper. Kafka has a strong dependency on Zookeeper. When you test those, you also want to make sure that you're testing it in a way that will stress the dependent components and see where additional breakpoints, because when you go production, you go with the entire system, not just a subset of it. More stories. So this story is once again uh, from the MapReduce 1 versus MapReduce 2 performance parity effort. Um, one of the most demanding performance tests we run internally, we also get our hardware partners to run. This is a tool that takes um, the full production workload at scale from our customers in different industries, then scale it down to a proof of concept cluster it will replay the exact um, load variation over time, the exact mix of different jobs, at the exact volume in numbers of jobs. So you see this is a truly concurrent scale test. We talk about scale, um, and there are many dimensions. We'll, we'll have a graph later about that. Uh, we can talk about data scale. We can talk about cluster scale. This is a high concurrency scale test. Um, the problem that it revealed, it, it's not even revealed by our specifically designed high concurrency test is what we call a live log issue. So in MapReduce 2, um, there are these uh, containers previously known as task slots. There, for every job, there is a container that's called the application master. This is new in MapReduce 2. It's basically a bookkeeping type task to keep track of the progress of the rest of the job. Um, every job has one of these things. So what happens when you have a high volume of concurrent jobs, we're talking about hundreds and thousands sometimes, is that all of the container, all of the resources on the cluster, they can be taken by these bookkeeping tasks that's actually making no progress. So that's a screenshot of the Yarn resource manager, and this is one way you can visually diagnose it. All of the slots are taken, none of the jobs are making progress because all of, the all of the resources in the cluster is actually taken by the application masters. So this is now fixed. Of course, we fixed this uh, before we actually ship the thing, but uh, it's kind of, the, the, it, it, this bug is revealed only under the most extreme production environments, but if we did not catch it, then our customers will catch it immediately when they deploy in production, and it will be an, embarrass an embarrassment for us and for the, all of the community. So um, if you can advance, uh, I guess the spirit of the story is if you don't test with, with enough cats, you will never get the too many requests. So the third pitfall is actually not in running the benchmark itself, but rather in how you interpret the results. Sometimes you get unexpected results, and if you don't know what the results are supposed to be, you may just take them at face value. So, I think it's yours. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, basically, the, to summarize this in short, if a result sounds too good to be true, then it probably is not true. So this implies all of us should have an idea about what is our performance model, what is too good to be true, what are the expected system bottlenecks, and so on and so forth, uh, and where are the hardware constraints, the workload constraints. Otherwise, we see a number, we have no idea whether that's good or too good to be true. And we have tons of examples of things that in, in, you look at the data and it should make you go, huh, why is that happening? And people actually did not go, huh. They just said, oh, this is cool. So, as a ex first example, we have a model, demonstrating models, and we have this model of how the world works in which supermodels cannot just go around eating as much ice cream as they want. And if you see a supermodel with ice cream, you kind of ask yourself, is she really eating it? Is it just a photo? Is she eating ice cream all the time? Probably not. You kind of have an idea of how things actually behave. By the way, my example, he had nothing to do with it, and he wanted me to tell you he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> he did I not. eat a lot of ice cream, but I exercise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
So yeah, you, maybe a lot of people have naturally high metabolism. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying that some things require more explanation. And the same thing in our computing world, a lot of things just require some more explanation and investigation. If someone tells you this test is going, doing an action over the network and it's back in under two milliseconds, uh, ask him where did it come from? Did you really go over the network or did you use a local cache? Because under two milliseconds it's pretty fast. If someone tells you I'm reading from spinning a disk and the times look like, you know, in the microseconds and it looks a bit too much like a SSD, are you really reading from spinning a disk? Is it actually spinning? Are you actually doing six? Are you caching, caching things somewhere? What's going on there? If someone sells you, like uh, Jeff Darcy said, if someone sells you a distributed system that under a network partition is 100% consistent and 100% available, something is wrong. You know it's wrong because you have this model in your mind of how the universe works like, and what, what is the universe, and you know that if you test it enough, it's going to break, and you don't need to run the test. You know something is going to break. If your vendor tells you, I'm running this query here and here, and it's 100 times faster here than here, well, 100 times faster is a lot. Where did the time come from? Is it hardware? Where is it a bottleneck that got resolved? What was the bottleneck? Is it realistic to get 100 time improvement by solving this actual bottleneck? Anything that a model cannot explain is something that you have to question and say, look, something doesn't make any sense here. And some specific examples. As I mentioned, I went to a lot of customers to uh, help them get their Hadoop to production. And one of the most common things that happened to me is that a customer would call me up and he would already downloaded Hadoop and tried it out and tell me, oh my God, Hadoop is amazing. I had this query taking 45 minutes in uh, Oracle or Teradata or Netiza. It only took two seconds in Impala. Impala is unbelievably amazing. Please come over and help me get it to production. And I'm like, okay, Impala obviously is amazing. We wrote it, but I'm not sure it's quite that amazing. And so you look into how did you actually run the test? And invariably you find out that the Oracle system is a very, very busy production server with uh, not enough disks and a lot of network latency from the server to the disks. And then also not enough CPUs for the kind of workloads they're trying to get it to do. And then you go to Impala and you find that this is a 20 node cluster and obviously it's brand new. So this one query was the only thing running on all the CPUs and all the memory in those 20 nodes. And they couldn't really copy all the data from Oracle to Hadoop. So they just took a small subset, something that will entirely fit in memory. And yay, two milliseconds and 45 minutes and Impala is amazing. And usually we try to talk them into, okay, let's get all the data and how many concurrent users are you actually having in production and let's run something that actually emulates all those users. And usually you still get improvements, partially because Impala being not as expensive as other systems, you can actually afford to buy 20 machines. 20 Oracle are super, super, like in the multi-million dollars. 20 Impala nodes are actually fairly relatively affordable. So you, usually you still state all those improvements, but the thing is that it's not magic. You can explain those improvements by saying how many CPUs are applied, how much memory is applied, how many disks are applied. It's not that, hey, magic. The second story is that Scoop is a tool that uh, is used to move data from relational databases to Hadoop and back. And the customer hired me to help him find the best configuration for this tool. So you can do a lot of t different types of inserts when loading data to a database. You can use different numbers of uh, mappers on the Hadoop side to make, get different levels of concurrency. You can do all kinds of tuning tips and tricks. And he asked me to try all of them and tell him which is the fastest configuration. And one of the tuning tricks that I have is that Oracle databases allow two types of inserts into Oracle tables. You can do a direct writes, meaning creating Oracle data blocks, writing them directly to disk, bypassing buffer cache, locks, latches. Or you can do normal inserts, which involve writing to memory and taking the necessary locks to write to the direct memory structures. And then there is another process that does the cleanup to the disk. You have to wait for the redo logs to sync. There is a lot of uh, stuff happening around that. 
And we usually expect for very large data writes to be much faster with direct writes, bypassing all the locking and latching and all that, because you have to do it for every buffer, and if there is a lot of them, it can be pretty impressive. We found out that actually normal inserts were three times faster. And I was sitting with the customer and like, you know, it never happened to me before. It cannot be three times faster. Something is super wrong. And we looked into the Oracle side of the test framework. And well, we had a rack cluster. It was three node rack cluster. In aggregate, it had 300 gigabytes of memory allocated for its cache. And we were the only thing writing to it. And it was about 50 gigabytes of writing. So again, writing to memory without ever hitting disk, without taking locks, without ever contending with anyone else for them, basically just dumping 50 gig of data directly to memory will be faster than writing 50 gigs of data to disk. No doubt about it. And that will be around three times faster because there's some overhead. It, we may have been able to tune it to be even faster than that. But the thing is that on a real system, you will not see those benefits. It will actually, you will, have, you will have contention, production people will uh, grumble, grumble, because suddenly they have to contend with massive Hadoop processes, writing data as, fa as fast as possible. So it's like, okay, we told the customer, these are the results you got, and here are the numbers you paid for, but also here's our test framework. Please run it yourself on a more realistic system when you get something more realistic to test it against, because this doesn't make any sense. So the third story is something I had to personally deal with. Uh, this was uh, mid last year. Uh, one of our customers, they expanded that cluster. And uh, to their credit, they, as a proof of concept, kind of you know, proof that our new expanded production cluster is functional, ready to receive the expanded production workload. To their credit, they ran Terasol on it. They noticed that it was 100x faster. And I got an email uh, passed to me. Can you please comment? This sounds like a miracle. What just happened here? Turns out, um, Terrasol by design is meant to be an external sort benchmark. It's meant to stress disk and shuffle over the network. Those two are the intended bottlenecks. Now, this customer, after they expanded the cluster, and they are still testing a sort of the same data size. Turns out they've expanded the cluster so much that all of their sorting and merging can now take place in memory. They've tuned their Hadoop cluster quite well. So Hadoop by itself, by its, their, its default configuration, is able to figure out it can sort everything in memory. So it turns out that what was previously a disk plus network bottleneck benchmark now becomes a purely network bottleneck benchmark. So it's kind of similar to the example you just heard from Gwen. Writing to memory is a lot faster than writing to disks. Now, the spirit of all of the three stories we tell you is that, yes, there are miracles. And yes, there are usually science and engineering facts behind them. And yes, sometimes those are applicable to you or to your customer um, very specific use case. But it kind of it's depends on all of us as both vendors, partners, customers to figure out what is the hard facts behind these miracles. Otherwise, we see one, we have no idea whether that will translate to real life, to common case. The first benchmark is not something that you typically do to yourself. It's something that we as vendors do to you which is biased benchmarks. We take a test and make it, use hardware and software and workloads that make us look good, and not necessarily things that are actually relevant to you. And there are multiple ways we do it, and we'd like to warn you so you can worry about our benchmarks, but also worry about our competitors and unrelated vendors' benchmark. The first of all is those is cherry picking. So we may have like a collection of 100 queries we can possibly run, we actually run all of them, but the final report in the press release that actually gets to you includes about five. Those are obviously the five that looked best out of the hundred that we ran originally. Uh, the same way, sometimes customers actually give us a benchmark and say, please run it on your hardware and tell us the results. And we notice that the benchmark includes some randomality. So it may randomly generate some of the data or randomly generate sync times, random number of users, a lot of randomality stuff. 
In this case, we don't hesitate to cheat. We run it over and over and over and over again and pick the best result, the one that makes us look best. Is that you, if you give your vendor uh, something that contain randomality, in my opinion, you kind of ask for it. So cherry picking is the first, uh, our first cheat. The other cheat is rigging the workload. So again, you just, we get to figure out what we run as a benchmark. We pick a workload that makes us look good. For example, if you, you know our system is fantastic for writes and kind of slow for reads, we can run a test, that, a workload mix that includes one write for every 100 reads, will make us look fantastic, has absolutely nothing to do with what you will want to do with the system eventually. Very, very few use cases actually have uh, one write for 100 reads. And again, that's something that I've, I cannot point to the vendor because we promised to be nice. I've seen it uh, being done. It's even better if you can actually get to control the hardware and rig the hardware to be very nice fit for the workload. Like pick brand new SSDs for your writes, the ones that did not fall off the cliff yet. That's even better. And when you look at workloads, there's actually a bunch of ways to look at them. Sure. So this is a picture um, I've been drawing for uh, quite a while now. And I, th I hope this will help you uh, think about some of the ways of assessing your own workload and assessing whether the workload that uh, a vendor or someone else has given to you as a performance benchmark actually applies to your own. So at a high level, you can think of a big data workload as having three different dimensions. The first is the data dimension, big data, the data part of big data. Uh, underneath that, think about what is the data size, the uh, data schema, and the data skew. So the volume of data, how the data relates to each other, how frequently is it accessed versus it's not accessed. Second dimension is compute. And for that, you can think about it in a variety of ways. One way is to think about the hardware demands it places on the underlying system. So think, is the CPU heavy? Is it disk heavy? Is it network heavy? Is it memory heavy? Um, another way is, for example, if you have a uh, a relational database type workload, SQL type workload, then you, think, you can think of the compute in terms of SQL abstractions, such as does it have a lot of joins, does it have a lot of scans, does it have a lot of selects, are your where clauses a bazillion lines long, or is it only half a line long? If we are talking about MapReduce workload, then in terms of the MapReduce abstractions, is it shuffle heavy, is it sort heavy, does it have a lot of combiners in each of the map output stage and the reduce stages, so on and so forth. And the last dimension, possibly the most interesting, is load as a function of time. So low variation over time. Now this, uh, you can think of it in terms of what is the average load, what is the bursts, and bursts are characterized by both the peak, how high they are, and the duration, how wide they are. And also, the last one uh, under load is the mix of jobs and queries that can run on the system. So if we're talking about um, a, uh, the read and write example, if we're talking about 1 to 100 write heavy versus read heavy, that's one type of workload. If it varies over time, in the evening it switches to something else, that's a completely different load. So uh, low variation over time and uh, compute and data, those are the uh, first level ways you can think about workload, how you can uh, find out what your workload is and what the benchmark workload that your vendor has supplied and whether that actually matches your own. Okay, and the third way we cheat in uh, benchmarks is using hardware that may or may not be relevant to what our users are using. And this is actually most visible if you look at TPC seed benchmarks and you see vendors using hardware that is not even available for sales yet or ever in some cases. And you're like, yeah, they got fantastic results and they had to pay $5 per transaction. And most of us, not in the business of paying $5 per database transaction. And similar to fantastic cars that you would probably not want to commute in, even though they must be tons of fun. So at some point, I will be a benchmarking professional for one of those ultra-rich companies like Oracle or HP and get to play with very sexy hardware that currently I cannot afford and my customers don't really afford either. 
So it's kind of a checklist. So if you look at the vendor benchmark, you kind of want to make sure that you get full information about what hardware that is they use, the configuration, so a number of network cards can have different types of bonding and teaming between them. Uh, disks can be rated in different ways. Uh, is it, okay, so you got what is the hardware, is it actually similar to what you're intending to buy is the next question. What queries did they run? Are they representative of my workload at all? Is, if they took a standard benchmark and said we modified it, make sure you know how they modified it and if the modifications make any sense to you. If they chose a subset of a specific benchmark, why and how did you choose those specific queries? And do I get a chance to try to reproduce the results with the rest of the queries that are not here? So since I happen to have a vendor right next to me, we can actually try this exercise. So we are looking at the benchmark of Impala versus the rest of the SQL on Hadoop world. And those look like fantastic results. So please tell us what hardware did you use? So by the way, uh, before we get into the, the in-depth um, demo Q&A here, um, reason we picked this is uh, this is actually one graph that we had a lot of community scrutiny over because um, this is showing query durations and Impala, our SQL on Hadoop engine is the blue line, so it's lower, a lot lower than everything else. So it's actually a very, very good result. Before we publish, we have to go through the due diligence of checking for ourselves whether we are kidding ourselves about these results. And after publication, um, there's a lot of being, being a lot of community scrutiny about this. So everything that Gwen asks uh, should be bread and butter to me by now. Yeah, so go and ahead. And this is unscripted. <laughs> Go ahead, which hardware did we use for the test? Okay, so hardware, um, we use a single rack uh, 21 node cluster that's running on 10 gig ethernet, um, dual socket, 12 core, 24 thread CPU, uh, 12 one terabyte disks, um, 11 of which are HDFS, one is the OS disk, and um, 380 odd gig memory. So out of those, um, the 10 gig ethernet, that's still kind of uh, not the dominant network speed out there, but uh, we have strong reason to believe it will be soon. Uh, and the other one is the 380 gig size RAM, gigabyte RAM, that is way above what a lot of our customers currently use. But I see some of the audience saying that, whatever. Uh, so again, <laughs> from our hardware vendors and from the trends we see, you know, uh, RAM at that size, in part because a lot of these big data type engines, they do a lot of performance optimization by caching in RAM that's up and coming. But those are the two things that we have to, that we are very conscious is a little bit ahead of reality at the moment. But you know, as you oh, mentioned- Oh, and by the way, all of the query engines are run on the same set of hardware. So it's, the hardware is a little bit ahead, but it's a apples to apples comparison. Yeah, but you know, it's, as you said, it's very different from my hardware. All my nodes have 64 gigabyte RAM, maybe 128. I don't have anything like what you have in the lab. Uh, can I rerun the test on my hardware and see what are my results? Yeah, actually, um, for that reason and for reasons of independent verification, we actually uh, put together, package the test harness we had and open source it. So there's a blog to this, there's a link on that to a GitHub repo that uh, anybody can download and run it on their own hardware. Um, we expect uh, for hardware that, that is less capable, we expect the performance will be universally lower. If the hardware is too wimpy, then probably you'll see everything is equally bad. Uh, but we believe that for something in between, yes, the numbers will be different, the multiples will be different, but at least the order of greater than and less than, that should, that we believe to our knowledge should still be preserved. What about the workload? What workload did you use to do the test? So these are um, 20 out of 99 TPC DS queries. So we talked about cherry picking earlier, and this is, are we cherry picking? ourselves to make it look good. So um, 20 out of 99 is actually historical context and convenience. Um, the historical context is when we first started tracking these 20 queries, um, the majority of the community, 
they are talking about Hive Benchmark, which is a, a set of five queries that we desire artificial, and more importantly, that our customers have come back to us and say it is artificial. But then we move, upgraded ourselves to TPCH. So this is a transaction processing console, TPC, their flagship OLAP online analytical processing benchmark. We do a subset of those. Um, and then we realized and we consulted with the TPC community that the more demanding benchmark is actually TPC DS, TPC decision support, uh, in terms of the schema, in terms of query complexity, so on and so forth. Now, within TPC DS, it's actually kind of annoying to implement because it's got three star schemas, each a very huge fact table surrounded by a bunch of dimension tables. We looked at it inside, and all three kind of looks like the same. Uh, so for convenience sake, we started by implementing just one star schema, so one of them, and that, of course, limited the number of queries we can run. And one schema it also limited the joins that we can do within the schemas that are not implemented and so on and so forth. Hence, it's 20 out of 99, but of course, we just told you about cherry picking. Uh, we are super conscious of that, so look for uh, our future blog posts in, on this topic. Okay, and the last pitfall, we're getting close to the end, is about how you communicate your results. Uh, because you only know about the results from the way your vendors will communicate them, and your managers will know about the results from the way you communicate them. So we believe that there should be a lot of information communicated. It's kind of like in journalism, you have the five W, who, when, what, where, whatever. Um, in uh, benchmarks, you want to have a lot of uh, things like who, who did the test? Is it someone I trust? Who validated the test? Was it as any independent or community validation that nobody cheated or made up numbers? What did they test? Did, if they intended to test and compare SQL engines, did they actually compare SQL engines or did they also manage to play with file formats and compression to completely invalidate the test? How did they run the test? What was driving it? Is it an, if it's an open source uh, test framework, it's way better than some kind of secret uh, way of running tests. Uh, why did they get those specific results? Watch for, out for miracles, right? That, that's where you end them. Is the results matching my experience of what can be getting, they could be getting given the hardware and the software? And obviously, why does it matter? Why am I reading those re results in the first place? I'm trying to decide how much harder to buy and I want to see scalability tests. If I'm trying to uh, dis pick the fastest out of uh, multiple, I want to see some kind of comparison. So a really good example of how to communicate results is from TPC. And I have to admit that I was shocked when I first looked at the TPC full disclosure report because they go into disgusting details. They, I mean, I don't know if you can read, but they go into the power cord and how many power cords and how much they cost and the copper wire cables. And this is kind of insane. And they go into the same level of details everywhere. The server that is driving the workload is covered as well as the server that is handling the workload. The software they use every little tuning parameter for Oracle, it's pages on pages on pages of tuning parameters and you can go, huh, I would never run this in production. Oh my God, this is insane. What do they do for benchmarks? Operating system tuning. Um, the, the queries themselves, obviously, the, the systems that was used to drive the queries, every tiny detail, it's really, really impressive. So um, this slide is just covering everything Gwen has said, but I just want to highlight one point. Uh, one of the reasons that the Transaction Processing Council is usually held up as one of the gold standards in performance benchmark, uh, in performance benchmark community is the fact that they have dedicated auditors. So the last bullet point there. Uh, dedicated auditors whose professional credibility and stake lies in their ability to spot miracles, to spot the orange versus apple comparison, so on and so forth. And to make it even more impressive, auditors don't begin by a stamp of approval and they are able to audit anything. Um, they must pass the certification test on each benchmark. So this is a test they pass and they can actually fail uh, to pass it the first time that saying they are able to, they are credited to audit a specific benchmark. 
So for example, the Transaction Processing Council, they recently put out the, um, the TPC Express Hadoop Store benchmark, and I'm actually one of the co-creators of that. Uh, so we are talking amongst ourselves now on setting up a auditor exam such that the auditors, they can be certified and begin to audit the results that come out. So this is just similarly, uh, the SOAR benchmark, we mentioned that quite a few times. The official SOAR benchmark, their auditing aspect is also fairly credible because how they go about it is they get the previous winners to audit the new results from the new submissions. So imagine, you know, this sets up a handing over the torch type dynamic. Imagine if you are in the position of a current record holder of a sort and you are asked to audit the result of a new thing that's gonna take your record away, you're gonna make sure that you're not handing over your sort benchmark winner's title unless you believe this new submission to be equally worthy. So this is you know, some of the independent checking type dynamics that goes on. So a lot of the results of uh, benchmarks are communicated not just in nice papers and long lists of numbers, people usually use graphs. And I notice that sometimes people only look at graphs. So it's worthwhile talking about good graphs versus bad graphs. This is a horrible graph. I made it myself about five years ago. And at the time, I thought it was good enough to actually present. Uh, the thing that is most missing is any meaning out of that. Because five years later, and I have absolutely no clue what I tested, what are the numbers on the x-axis actually mean. Maybe there are users, but I have no idea how did they try to emulate them and why did they think I'm doing a good job of it. And of the green line, for example, I'm not even sure what, which numbers actually match it and where did it come from. I also find, found a good example. That's from the Clodera blog. And you can see, just by looking at the example, you can see, without any of the background, you can see that we tested Impala with a second, uh, at least one other workload because it's a multi-tenant performance test. And you can see on the x-axis that we assigned Impala increasingly large fraction of the resources of the cluster. And we have a model, so we expected that when we assign Impala 25% of resources, it will give 25% of its full cluster capacity performance. 50%, we expected 50%, and you see the nice model. The results are actually a bit higher than that, and you can see that the actual performance, the dots marking the actual performance. So I can see quite a lot by looking at it, but it's obviously not the full story. So uh, there, there's still a lot of explanation that needs for the, even a graph like that. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I will just say the concurrent workload, there is a concurrent workload. The concurrent workload is MapReduce. Um, there is a ton of detail about how we arrive at the model, the model dotted line. Uh, what, it, what do the error bars actually represent? Why they are so large? Why are the dots, if you can advance one slide, uh, why are the dots above the model? Is it a miracle or not? Especially if we look at the companion graph of MapReduce multi-tenant performance, the concurrent competing processing, it's a similarly shaped graph. It's closer to the dot, but similarly shaped. So there's a lot of context going on there. Um, roughly, the answer is uh, uh, kind of a miracle, but what's going on is statistical multiplexing of bottlenecks on different hardware. So you got the Impala query, the MapReduce job, they need this at different times. They need CPU at different times. They need memory at different times. So it's kind of a constructive interference. They can still get more than their fair share of processing just because they are demanding different things at different times. So kind of a miracle. But as you can see, even a graph that has a lot of text still needs more text. We okay. have some time for questions. We'll stop here. Questions, thank you. <laughs> One question, yes. Yes, in fact, um, uh, the yarn life lock issue that was, uh, from, that was found using a tool where we recorded the customer MapReduce workload and replayed it. So it's a very advanced capability right now. We've built it only for MapReduce, but um, yeah, expanding. And we're still around for questions later. We're sorry we ran out of time. 
I'll ask one more, one more question. I'll take my, uh, <laughs> my privilege. Uh, so this is great. I'm, I'm a performance engineer at, at MarkLogic. We do NoSQL database stuff. Um, so one of the things that I, I didn't quite see mentioned, but which is, tends to be relatively important at scale, is the masking of bad performance. So, you know, if you, if you have a large scale and then you reduce by, say, half the scale, you, you very frequently I see uh, if knock-on effects, right, other bad performance coming from some other part of the system or reliant on some other resource which is being depleted that was masked previously by the scale at which I was running the benchmark at the, the, the 2x scale as opposed to the 1x scale. So I, I was just wondering point, if you've ever yeah. seen that before. If you, um, I know you tend to do a lot of big things. So <laughs> when you go a little bit smaller, though, you you tend to draw out the um, the inefficiencies, perhaps, in the utilization of resources by other parts, uh, but other parts of the algorithms or the you know the sorting or whatever it's happening. Right. So, so the the general response to that is yes, you're absolutely right. And at different scales, the system bottlenecks is going to shift around. And if you are going to be running your production workload at whichever scale, then yes, we can test on proof of concept scale or over test it on a large scale. Um, but in the end, there's, there's no, uh, OK, so actual test is you run a probe test on your production cluster using your production workload, using your production data, that's inconvenient and requires a lot of sophistication to do without, for example, me taking down the department's filer. Um, every step back from that is going to be a model of some kind, an extrapolation back on what you expect the thing to be when you run it in production. So at different, when you do different jumps, the different jump back is going to be different. So it, 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 there is no one true answer to that. It's something that we have to be conscious of, and we have to consciously look for it. Okay, we'll answer Thanks, more guys. questions offline. Thank you, guys. Thank you.